All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Uh, here's the scene before us in this chapter. We got about halfway through it last time. Uh, he's just finished. Jesus has just finished the Passover meal with the 12 disciples. And then he identifies Judas Iscariot as the one who is going to betray him. But nobody understood what was happening at that moment when Jesus tells Judas, um, you know, what you do, do quickly. And it says Judas leaves, and the other disciples are wondering, what's going on? Why is he leaving? Some thought, oh, he's got the money, so he's probably going to go buy some more provisions or give some money to the poor. But Judas had already taken 30 pieces of silver from the religious leaders as payment for the betrayal of Jesus. 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave, and that's what Judas considered Jesus as his own personal puppet. It's kind of like the Word of Faith movement. They tell Jesus what to do and how to do it. That's not the way the, work, the Bible works. That's not the way God works. God tells us what to do and how to live our lives. We don't tell him what to do. Then we create a, you know, God in our own image and likeness. That's an idol. And so Judas, he'll never call him Lord, but he calls him teacher, rabbi. And so Judas leaves, and he betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. He looks at Jesus as a slave. He's not doing what I want him to do, so I'm going to sell him out. So this is when Judas runs to the wicked men with the news that Jesus and his disciples are going to soon be going to the Garden of Gethsemane. So that would be the perfect time to arrest Jesus. There wouldn't, it would be the middle of the night. There would be no crowds there. There would be nobody to you know, uh, interrupt them. It would just be an opportunity for them to grab Jesus and haul him off as he will betray him. So Judas leaves. And then once he leaves, Jesus gives the uh, 11 disciples uh, the true meaning of what we call the new covenant. Um, he, he's going through Passover. He takes the third cup, the cup of blessing, and, and he starts talking to them about what this new covenant is in his blood. And it's just a glorious time because Jesus will be the final Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. The old covenant, as you know, was based on the sacrificial animals, the blood that they would shed, and it would be a temporary covering for the sins of the people. But the blood of Jesus, why it's so amazing, so awesome, is that his blood doesn't just cover our sins, it removes our sins. He takes away our sins. He washes us clean from all of our sins. That's the perfect blood that Jesus poured out upon the cross. His blood alone can cleanse us of all sin. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells it like this in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so... They're proclaiming the sufficiency of the Lord's death. That's why when we do communion the first Sunday of the month, you know, we do it in remembrance of what Christ has done for us, and we acknowledge that His once and for all sacrifice is sufficient to cleanse us of all sin. We're told, and where we left off in verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And I mentioned last week, and we read through Psalm 118, that was Quite possibly the psalm that they sang as they crossed the Kidron Valley and head up towards um, uh, the Mount of Olives. And why that psalm? Because there's six psalms that they would sing during Passover, and that was the sixth one, the final one. And it's all about Jesus and what he would do for us. So it's a short hike that Jesus now, uh, as they go down the valley up into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, he'll predict to his disciples, once again, what's going to happen to him. And so that's where we pick up in verse 31 of chapter 26. And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So once again, he tells them 
And this is the final time that he is going to die, and he'll die again as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But he says he will see them again after he raises from the dead. That's the simple gospel message. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel that saves. That he died for our sins. That he was buried. That he rose from the dead on the third day. He paid the price in full for our sins. But it would mean nothing unless he conquered the grave and rose from the dead. So... Here Jesus quotes from Zechariah 13, verse 7, where we're told that God is the one who would strike the shepherd, that's Jesus, and as a result, once he's stricken, then all the sheep would be scattered. Now, don't forget this important fact. The crucifixion, the death of Jesus, it's not some horrible, tragic mistake. This was the eternal plan of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is something that from eternity past was in the works because, you know, we're told that Jesus was crucified from before the foundation of the earth. God knew what Adam and Eve was going to do. He knew they were going to sin and rebel against him and his word. Their sin would be passed on to the rest of the human race, all of us. And that's why Jesus knew from eternity past he had to come. He had to die for us. His death was prearranged. In other words, he had to die for all of our sins. He had to die in order for us to live. But again, it's only because Jesus rose from the dead that we know that the Father has accepted and He was well pleased with the sacrifice of His Son. So He had to die so that we could live, but He had to rise from the dead so that we could live forever with Him. That's why the, the resurrection is so very important. So when Jesus tells the disciples they're going to scatter when he dies, it must have really bummed them out. Except for Peter. He's not bummed out. He gets very angry. And actually, he gets very puffed up with pride when Jesus mentions this scripture that the sheep will be scattered once the shepherd is stricken. So look at verse 33. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Remember, Jesus just said, It is written. And then he quotes from the prophet Zechariah. But here's Peter basically saying, Zechariah, he might be a prophet of God, but he's wrong on this account. That's what he's saying. Zechariah, yeah, he's a prophet of God, but he's making a mistake here. All of us aren't going to be scattered. I'm not going to be scattered. I'm never going to deny you. These other apostles might wimp out, but not me. Look at verse 34. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So first, Peter rejects the written word of God, Zechariah, and now he rejects the spoken word of God from Jesus. And so Peter's pride is on full display at this moment, but he would eventually learn two very important lessons. Number one is, don't argue with God's word. Don't question God's word. You might not understand it, but don't argue and question and doubt it. Because God's word is sure. God's word is true. If you argue with God's word, you'll eventually figure out God's right and you're wrong. Pretty simple. Peter says it like this. And, you know, again, he learned this lesson. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Even Zechariah 13 verse 7 that Jesus quoted to him. He understands. Yep, that's confirmed which you do well to heed. I didn't heed it at first, but now I do. Years later, he understood. As the light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. I'm not going to deny you. Zechariah is wrong. Well, no, it's not your interpretation, Peter. You are wrong. God's word is true. So no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that's lesson number one. The second lesson that Peter had to learn was that pride always comes before a fall. 
you know, for years, history tells us, years later, for many, many years, until Peter died, essentially, um, when Peter would be walking down the road and somebody would see him coming towards them, they would start to go, cock-a-doodle-doo, mocking Peter. I mean, that's what history says. They, they mocked him because he denied the Lord. Pride comes before a fall, and I'm sure we're all guilty of saying stuff that we later regret. And like many of us, Peter was very, very proud. He was probably believing he was much stronger, much tougher than he actually was. And we can be the same way at times. So this is what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Again, Peter's writing this 30 years after he denies the Lord, but now he's writing 1 Peter, and he says, hey, we need to submit ourselves. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud. Peter knew firsthand, but, God, uh, but gives grace to the humble, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And so Peter learned his lesson uh, the hard way. Uh, he learned it, but it was difficult. And even though he would really fall hard, he would fall bad, we'll see that Jesus was right there to restore him. Jesus was there to lift him up. He wasn't done with Peter. When you blow it and you sin or you say something wrong, you do something stupid, God's not done. He's not saying, ah, you're done. I don't want anything to do with you. No, He continually gives us grace. He for, if you're in Christ, you're forgiven. You'll, you'll discover one way or another, He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He is with you always to the end of the age. That's the last thing He says in this uh, gospel message in Matthew. But... That's for all of us, not just the 11 disciples. It's for all of his people. He is with us always. So look at that last sentence in verse 35. It says, and so said all of the disciples. They're following Peter's lead. Peter's, I'm never going to deny you. Yeah, we're not going to deny you either. We're going to be there. We're not going to forsake you, Jesus. If we have to die with you, we'll die with you. These guys are sincere. I mean, they loved Jesus as much as they could, as much as they could muster up in their own hearts. They loved Jesus. They didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Now, this is before Pentecost. And you see this radical difference between, you know, pre-Pentecost and post-Pentecost. You know, before the Holy Spirit was given to the church on the birth of the church at Pentecost, these guys would deny the Lord. These guys would run away. These guys would be in fear and then Jesus breathed the breath of life into them, the Holy Spirit, it says in John chapter 20. And then he says, okay, the Spirit's in you, but he's going to come upon you. In Acts chapter 180, he gives them that promise that the Holy Spirit will come upon them and they'll be witnesses to Jesus in Judea, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So they really did want to follow him and obey him. But at the same time, Jesus will let us know here in a little while there Spirit was willing, but their flesh was weak. That's a good indication that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, one thing we need to learn from Jesus in John 15, 5, is where he says, without me, you can do nothing. Right? Without Jesus, you can do nothing. Except for make a lot of mistakes. Except for say wrong things. Except for doing stupid, sinful, fleshly things. Without him, you can do nothing. But here's the flip side, Philippians 4.13, where Paul says, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So without Jesus, we can't do anything. But through Christ, we can do all things because he's the one that enables us to do what he calls us to do. So look at verse 36. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. Now, Gethsemane is a beautiful spot on the western side of the Mount of Olives. You know, when you're in, in Jerusalem, if you're on the Temple Mount, you can look down the Kidron Valley and you can see the, the Mount of Olives. So that's to the left where the greenery is, that's the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. Um, 
That's the Mount of Olives there. So go to the next slide. That's the bottom of the Kidron Valley. That's Absalom's tomb. And then from there, the green space on the left. And that's from the Garden of Gethsemane looking back at uh, the Temple Mount. So when Jesus would be there. And that's where he'd go to pray a lot in the Garden of Gethsemane. I love going to this place because there's some trees there. Check that last one out. Uh, the one in the background, they've got some huge olive trees and the root system they've dated back 2,000 years. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So that's where Jesus was with his disciples. The thing about Garden of Gethsemane is that Gethsemane means oil press. So that's where they would gather up the olives. They'd bring them to the oil press, Gethsemane, in the garden there. And they would crush and they would grind the olives. And then out would come the very valuable olive oil. Very symbolic what Jesus is doing. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He is going to and being prepared to be crushed and ground up. And what is produced? Olive oil. Symbolic of the Holy Spirit. He had to be crushed and ground up in order for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon our lives. So Jesus, who knew no sin, was about to become sin for us. Now, think about this. In the first garden, the Garden of Eden, that's where mankind broke fellowship with God. In the Garden of Eden, you got Adam and Eve, and God would come down and says, in the cool of the evening, just hang out with them. It was a great time until they fell. They sinned against the Lord. Fellowship was broken. God cannot you know, be around sin. And so they tried to cover their nakedness with um, fig leaves. <laughs> you ever seen those things? They're itchy. And so God says he put skins on them, probably lamb skins and, you know, prophetic. He covers them with lamb skins. And so that's the only way we can have fellowship. The Lamb of God had to be slain. His blood had to be poured out. And it's here in the Garden of Gethsemane where he begins to reconcile sinful mankind back to himself as he starts this process that will lead him to the cross. And that is where he would pay the price in full upon the cross. So look at verse 37. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and he began to be sorrowful. Now picture Jesus. This is hard for me to picture this. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So again, it's hard to picture Jesus in this condition. He goes with Peter, James, and John into a little further into the garden into the olive grove. He leaves the other, you know, uh, eight disciples now in, you know, they fall asleep where he first met with them there. Why was Jesus so sorrowful? Why is he, it says, in such great distress? Because he knows the whole purpose for him leaving the glory of heaven and coming into this sin-filled world, the whole purpose for him coming to earth the whole reason behind the incarnation is about to take place. He was about to be crucified for the sins of all humanity. And the price to redeem us was going to be his blood. But I don't think it was the physical pain. I don't think it was the physical suffering that he was about to go through. We're going to read, uh, Lord willing, next time, that he'll be beaten so severely you could not even recognize who he was. Uh, Isaiah says he was marred more than any other human being. I mean, how many blows to his face did they give him? We don't know, but he was brutally beaten. It's not that pain. It's not that pain and it's not that suffering. Even on the cross, that's not the physical pain that he's wrestling with here. I think it's the spiritual ramifications of what he's about to face as his Father in heaven is about to pour out his wrath, his judgment upon his Son Jesus, who becomes sin for us. And this is what Jesus will struggle with, as we'll see here in a moment. Look at verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
Jesus prayed, as we'll see, he prayed the same prayer three times. Oh, my Father, if it is possible. If what is possible? If there's any other way to save these lost sinners than for me to drink this cup. What is that cup he's referring to? What is that cup he's praying would pass from him? Again, this is none other than the cup of God's righteous indignation, his righteous cup of wrath that he was going to pour out in full measure upon his son. That cup of wrath is what every single person in the world deserves, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, because we have all sinned, we've all blown it, we've all rebelled against God, we're the ones that deserve the punishment, we're the ones that deserve the separation from God, but this is what Jesus would face for us, the punishment for all of humanity against our sins against God. This is the penalty that we deserve because we're the ones that rebelled. Look at this psalm, Psalm 75, verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out, surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. It's referring to the cup of God's wrath. Revelation speaks of this cup many times. Look at this one in Revelation 14, verse 10. Uh, this is about those who worship the Antichrist, those who receive the mark of the beast. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of of the Lamb. And so Jesus here is praying, he's asking the Father, if there is any other way to save sinners than taking all of their punishment upon myself. Again, I don't believe any of us can comprehend what Jesus would go through on the cross in the spiritual realm, way beyond the physical suffering that his body would endure, was the spiritual separation he would experience for the only time in eternity. He'd be separated from the Father. Remember in the middle of his crucifixion, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not just quoting Psalm 22.1, but this is when Psalm 22.1 is coming to fruition. The Father was forsaking his only begotten Son on the cross at that moment because he was becoming sin. Jesus was taking upon himself all of our sin. That's why God's pouring out his wrath and judgment upon Jesus on the cross. It's unbelievable. I mean, Garrett mentioned this during worship, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, that's the Father, made him the Son who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus literally becomes the object of God's wrath and punishment for me and for you and for the sins of this world. It was at that moment that he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus was drinking the cup of God's wrath in full. Um, the Father, in a sense, turned his back on his Son because sin cannot be in the presence of God. God will not be in the presence of sin. This is the only time in eternity that fellowship was broken between the Father and the Son. And this is why Jesus told his disciples that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful. I mean, just dreading this. Even to death, he says. This is why Jesus prayed three times, Father, if it is possible, if there's any other way to save these sinful people apart from me being separated from you, but in all three prayers, Jesus would say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There's some that believe, oh, you can't ever pray that way. You should just pray it once and name it and claim it. If you pray it more than once, that shows your lack of faith. Baloney. So they'll even diss on Jesus for praying this prayer three times. That's not a godly prayer because they think I should get what I want because I'm a king's kid. No. Jesus in perfect obedience to his father is praying. Not my will. Your will be done. This is the meaning behind Philippians 2.8. It says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
Again, I cannot comprehend the greatness, the perfection, the depths of Jesus' love for me, for you, for the, the people of this world, in His willingness to be slaughtered and separated from the Father on our behalf. I mean, again, there's no words to fully describe the amazing grace, the unconditional love that He demonstrated for us as He becomes sin for us. Look at verse 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And here he says, The spirit is indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We can identify with that. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 44, gives us a little more insight into what's happening as he's praying these three prayers. It says, during this time, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. What is G Jesus is experiencing is known as hematidrosis. It simply means you're in such stress, such agony, that the bl uh, blood vessels in your face will rupture, and the blood will actually come out of the pores in your face. Three times Jesus prayed this prayer. He knows there's no other way to save sinners, and so he's completely surrendered his will. Not my will, your will be done. He surrenders his will to the Father's will. He has complete trust <laughs> that God's will is about to be accomplished. This isn't, this isn't taking Jesus by surprise. I mean, he's known from eternity past. The Bible says he was slain from the foundation of the earth. Jesus knew this was going to happen. And, and yet in the moment, the reality of going through this, it was, it was agonizing. But look at these verses in Hebrews 10. We have this powerful passage. It says, For it is not possible, starting in verse 4, it's not possible that the, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Again, they were just a temporary covering for sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, speaking of Jesus, he said... This is in the Old Testament um, scripture. Jesus is quoting um, or speaking in the Old Testament. He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. That's the incarnation. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so, unlike all the sacrificial animals that died <laughs> against their will, you know, you never see a lamb going, oh, good, this is great, I get my throat slit today. No, Jesus willingly allows himself to be sacrificed. He was the perfect sacrifice. Again, the sorrow... The distress that, was, that Jesus was under at this time, I cannot imagine how heavy it was. But now it's, you could say it's go time. You know, the hour of darkness is now going to come upon him. This is what we read in verse 45. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And, you know, these disciples are just exhausted. They couldn't stay awake. They keep falling asleep. But I'm sure when he says, Behold, the hour is at hand, they must have just been jolted awake. You know, and, oh, man, what's going on, Jesus? What are you talking about? Again, Jesus knew his hour had come. He was now prepared to enter uh, into the sole purpose and endure the sole reason why he came from heaven to earth. There's a remarkable um, conversation that's recorded in John chapter 12, verses 27 and 28. This is before they go to the garden, but this is John 12. Jesus and the Father are speaking. 
Check this out. Now my soul is troubled. This is Jesus speaking. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. What a remarkable, you know, I'm sure it just gave Jesus in his fleshly body just that confidence. Yep, I'm, I'm in the Father's will. I'm going to continue to go forward. This is what it's all about. Verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. So an incredible scene. It's in the middle of the night. We know the, the moon would be full because this is Passover. This great multitude are with Judas according to John's gospel, is a Roman cohort or a Roman detachment, which is 600 men. So here's Judas with 600 Roman soldiers with him and the religious leaders. And why are there so many? Why 600 of these guys? Because Jesus, uh, many times we've seen him. You know, they came to grab him and he just slipped through their midst. So they're thinking, okay, we got 600 Roman soldiers. We're going to surround him. He's not breaking through this line. They think they're in control. We'll see they're not. Verse 48. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one, sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now this tells me a couple of things. First of all, Jesus and his 11 disciples pretty much look like normal human beings. They look like you know, with Jesus and the eleven look like twelve hippies. I mean, seriously, they got long hair, beards, they're wearing robes. You know, it's not like, okay, you know, you guys know which one to grab. Well, no, they all kind of look the same. This tells me that Jesus did not have some halo over his head, like some pictures, you know, show him in the Garden of Gethsemane with this halo, or he's glowing in the dark, or he's floating two feet above everybody. Otherwise, Judas would have said, Hey, the guy that's glowing, go grab him. No. So he goes, that's how he identifies him. He's the one who I kissed. That's the one because they all kind of look pretty much normal human beings. And so he says, greetings, rabbi. And it says he kissed him. In the Greek, it means that he kept kissing him, probably just kissing him on cheek to cheek, you know, as the soldiers are coming around him. The apostle John, who wrote his gospel account about 30 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, he gives us an amazing event that takes place uh, at the same time. They're arresting him, and when they come to get him, check these verses out in John 18, starting in verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am, it says he, in the original, in your Bible, it'll have he in italics. That means it was added. I mean, Jesus says, ego eme, who are you seeking? I am. He's using the name of God, the eternal name of God. How do we know that? Well, look what happens when he says, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now, when he said to them, I am... I am he, but it's literally I am. They drew back and fell to the ground. <laughs> he just says, I am. They all fall over. You know, some churches like to say, oh, yeah, we love to slay people in the spirit. No, you don't. You don't want to slay anybody in the spirit. The only time somebody slayed in the spirit in the, book of, in the Bible is when Jesus slays his enemies. You don't want to be an enemy of God. You know, he doesn't go around sl slaying people, knocking them over. But when he speaks his holy name, I am, all of his enemies fall over. His disciples, they're not falling over. Judas may have, we're not told. But these guys, they fall to the ground. I think Jesus is just reminding them he's still in charge. I mean, Jesus says earlier, he goes, nobody takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord. Nobody takes my life, and I will take it up again. I will raise it up as well. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. So he's just letting them know, I'm in charge of this. You guys are here to arrest me, but he's willingly going to allow them to arrest him. Verse 50, but Jesus said to him, to Judas, friend, why have you come? He knows, but it's amazing to me that he would call him friend. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. 
And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all describe this scene of someone, unnamed someone, striking the servant of the high priest and cutting off his ear. It's only in the Gospel of John that we read that it was Peter. And John's not like, yeah, now I'm going to get it, Peter, you know, and narc on him. No, everybody knew who this was. But why did the first three Gospels not mention Peter? Because when they were written, Peter was still alive. And so Peter didn't need more persecution. He didn't need his name mentioned at this point. When John writes 25 years after Peter's dead, no problem. Yeah, it was John or Peter. It was Peter who cut off and he names Malchus. And that was his ear that was chopped off. And it's funny because it's in Dr. Luke's gospel account that tells us it was his right ear and Jesus picked up the ear, put it back on and healed him. And that was the last miracle Jesus did before the crucifixion. Amazing. Verse 52. But Jesus said to him, to Peter, put your sword in its place. Remember earlier he said, hey, should we get some swords? Yeah, you got two. That's enough. That's fine. You don't need swords. Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Put your sword away, Peter. This is not your battle. In other words, this is not your time to die, Peter. You know, if you start whacking everybody, you're going to be dead in no time. Peter would soon learn that the battles he would face for the next 35 years of his life were not against flesh and blood, but they were against powers, principalities. It was a spiritual battle that he would be in. Spiritual warfare, the Apostle Paul says it like this, 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, material, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That's why we as Christians don't go around with guns and knives and swords and putting it to somebody's head saying, believe in Jesus or you're dead. That's why we don't do that. Other religions like Islam, they'll put a sword to your throat, receive Allah, or you know, say Allah is the God and the Quran is the word of God, or whatever they say, or we're going to cut off your head. A lot of people have died that way. In the Middle Ages, some Christian groups tried to do that, stick a sword to their head. Jews, you believe in Jesus, we're going to kill you. And they killed many. That was part of the Inquisition. I mean, it was brutal. It was stupid. It was horrible. Jesus never forced us to become his followers. That's why we don't go around trying to force people into the kingdom of God. His invitation is simple. His invitation is beautiful. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. John 6.37 All that the Father has given gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Again, Peter would learn this lesson. Now I've always wondered what would happen if Peter wasn't just startled awake and just starts swinging his sword. What would have happened if he would have actually hit Malchus and cut off his head? That's what he was aiming for. He wasn't aiming for his ear in the middle of the night. He was trying to get this guy, and that'd be awesome, though. I think it'd be cool if it cut off his head and Jesus picks up his head and, ee, 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 and puts it back on. That'd be really cool. <laughs> be that as it may, that's not what happened. He and it just wildly swings, cuts off his ear. Jesus heals him. And this is why he says, put away your sword. Verse 53, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? A legion is what? 6,000 warriors. Because if I wanted to, Peter, I could call down 72,000 angels right now. It's not a big deal. These 600 soldiers are nothing. I just said I am and they all fall down. I could wipe them out in an instant. That's not a problem. So put your sword away. You don't need to try to defend me like this. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, King Hezekiah is freaking out because he's surrounded by all these Assyrians, 185,000 Assyrian 
soldiers are going to storm Jerusalem. And Hezekiah is thinking, we're done. And he prays out, calls to the Lord. What happens? Got it? 2 Kings 19, 35. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out. Maybe that was Jesus when it says the angel of the Lord. And killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when uh, people rose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So one angel wipes out 185,000. So 72,000 angels, these 600 soldiers, they're nothing. I mean, Jesus doesn't need the angels to defend him either. But verse 54, this is the key. Jesus says, How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Jesus is placing the word of God above everything else. The word of God must be fulfilled. And there are many, many scriptures in the Old Testament that tell us how Jesus was going to die. He'd be betrayed. He'd be arrested. He'd be led as a lamb to slaughter. He'd be crucified on a cross, Psalm 22. I mean, the list goes on and on. He says, I must fulfill all that the scriptures have declared about me, about why I am here. And guess, guess what? Here's something even you know that's relevant for us today. All scriptures must be fulfilled in these last days as well. As Christians, we're looking at the world around us, and we're thinking, well, where's the common sense? People are crazy. I mean, this is Isaiah 5.20. They say they'll call evil good and good evil. That's what we're seeing. Even in our little newspaper, they have letters to the editor. We, you know, Elizabeth and I will read those from time to time. And more and more, though, there's all these attacks against Christians. It's all because of the Roe v. Wade thing. And they're trying to justify, God slaughtered people in the Old Testament, so it's okay for us to slaughter babies in the womb. I mean, have you read any of those? They're just like, wow, this is crazy. They have no context of why God told Joshua and the rest of them, slaughter everybody there, because God had given those pagan nations 430 years to repent. And they got worse. And if they were like, they were like a rabid dog. If they got into the camp of the Jews, they would corrupt the Jewish people. So they had to be put down, so to speak, because they were so wicked. And God had given them so many opportunities to repent, and their hearts got harder and harder. That's the reason why God had them put them to death. It has nothing to do with innocent children in the womb. Be that as it may, we see a push in our world, the world leaders, um, the World Economic Forum is part of this. They want a one-world government. They want a one-world uh, you know, religion. They want a cashless society. They, they want a one-world economy. Guess what? That's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen in these last days. The Bible also tells us that it will be led by the Antichrist who will come on the scene, but he won't be revealed until after the rapture of the church. And once he's taking, uh, taken us out, then the Antichrist will be revealed. So this tells me we're getting very, very close to what the Bible mentions about the rapture. It's coming down the pike real soon. Look at verse 55. We'll close with these verses. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out? As against a robber with swords and clubs to take me, I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Again, even the disciples running away and fleeing from Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah. This is another great example of the followers of Jesus thinking, oh no, everything's falling apart. That's what these 11 are thinking when Jesus is being arrested. Everything's falling apart. He's our Messiah. What's going on here? No, from God's perspective, everything's falling into place. We look at our society, everything's falling apart. No, from God's perspective, everything is falling into place. Our sins had to be redeemed i had to be cleansed had to be um, shed blood for the blood of christ had to be put on the cross for us the only way we could be saved jesus could have easily rescued himself praise the lord he didn't if he did not allow himself to go through this if he would have called the legions of angels yeah 
set me free, then we would still be dead in our sins. Praise the Lord that Jesus fulfilled all the scriptures concerning his birth, his life, his miraculous ministry, even his beating that we'll see next time, his crucifixion. There are approximately 300 Old Testament scriptures that speak of his first coming, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them perfectly. There are about 300 prophecies in the Old and New Testament concerning his second coming. My money is on the fact that he will fulfill those perfectly as well, just like he did the first 300. He'll fulfill every promise he has made, not just generally, yeah, the word of God will be complete, but he'll fulfill every promise he's made to you and me. Because he has promised, not just the church 2,000 years ago, but he's you know, promised us, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. We will go through difficulties, we will face trials and struggles in this life. Jesus says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. But never lose track of Romans 8, 28, which tells us, and we'll close with this, and we know that some things, no, nah, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And we can only understand that truth if we walk by faith and not by sight. So, Lord willing, if we're here next week, we'll pick up and continue this amazing scene of what Jesus has done in fulfilling the Father's will.